So, introducing Mike Clark. Hello. <laughs> Mike Clark is one of the original Cygnosis designers that were based in Liverpool, UK. Cygnosis is still well known for making the Epic uh, Lemming series, Shadow of the Bee series, and many others that we will talk about. He composed the music. <laughs> <laughs> he, he will. Uh, <laughs> He composed the music and sound effects for the games at Cygnosis and many other companies. Cygnosis was bought out by Sony and might continue composing game music and sound effects for them. He recently left the company called Atomicom to work for himself. Correct me if anything is wrong there. No, that's all fine, yeah. Brilliant. Good. So, weirdly enough... Um, I was on Am eBay and just by chance looking at a load of eBay links and spotted this Amiga 3000 and literally I contacted Mike not knowing that Mike was who he was um, and was asking about the A3000 and there it is. <laughs> it's doing really well on eBay at the moment actually, isn't it? It's about nine kilograms. <laughs> yeah, probably about eight, uh, 50 to 80 quid on postage, is it? <laughs> like tanks they are. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I didn't realise Mike was who he was. And uh, I said, oh, could you come on and do talk a bit about the A3000? I just thought by chance he'd got it. But no, yeah, he's uh, the legendary man himself. So... Let's just go through it a little bit. Do you want to talk? I'll let you talk about the A3000 because I know I've done a bit of research, but I'll let you. I know uh, all the retro community been waiting for this. <laughs> yeah, have they? <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I've had it for quite some time. Um, well, I'll explain how I got it. I yep. got it because when. Before we got bought by Sony, we used to work down near the docks in Liverpool in a building called South Harrington Building. And we had another separate building there, which was uh, Century Buildings. And after we got bought by Sony, it was, a bit, it was in the 93 we got bought by Sony, which is earlier than most people think. Mm -hmm. um, and eventually we had money from them, and it meant that we could move out and go into a nice new building instead, which if you've seen any photos there's one of me standing outside the building with the, the owl on top. Right, that's okay, yeah. That's, yep. that's the nice, shiny new building that we moved into. Uh, and when we moved out, um, it, it really felt like uh, it was a new start. It really was, um, as you can imagine, with uh, all nice new premises and not the horrible old dirty building that we were in before because Century mm. Buildings was, was pretty nasty, it really was. That's where I was for quite a while. Um, and there was a storeroom there and storeroom just kept what was considered to be the old crap, basically. So <laughs> there was about 20 FM Towns machines. There was, uh, old Amiga hard drives. There was just lo loads of bits of hardware and loads and loads of discs. The discs were just all strewn across the floor. And I gathered all of the discs, took all of those home because they were just going to get binned. Should have taken all the FM towns because <laughs> they're worth quite a lot now. Um, yeah, they're very hard to very hard to come across these days. Uh, and then some of the Amigas were, were getting rid of them. The, the company bought A four thousands when we moved into the new building, so uh, there was a bunch of Amigas just going to get binned. Yes, and, uh, that was the, the three thousands. So I got three of them. I think it might have been four. And the reason I say four is because I've got the shell of one. Still got the motherboard, uh, just the shell, but there's no front plate on it. And I, I don't know where that came from. So I might have actually got four, even though I only thought I got three. 
Okay. Uh, I don't remember there's having four. I only remember three of them in the office. Uh, but nevertheless, they were getting thrown out. So mm. I asked if I could have them, and they said, yeah, well, they're getting binned. Yeah, do what you want. So I took them home. Now, two of them, cool. I uh, I cleaned them up. Because A3000s, they, they were, as I've read somebody say on some of the forums, they, they were the Rolls Royce of the Amiga. They were, they were the... They were the big one at the time. Yeah, at the time, yeah. They're very nice. I mean, they, they are really good machines. I think Haney used one mostly before the four... Well, I know the 4000 come out late, and by that time, it was all over. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, I uh, cleaned them up, got rid of all the old stuff on the, the hard drive and reinstalled them, uh, checked the ROM chips and everything like that. And I thought that because these are hard to come by and they're so expensive, and I've, I've got three of them. Uh, I'll sell two of them mm -hmm. uh, to people who really appreciate it. So some Amiga fans who've always wanted a 3000. So I sold each one of them after I'd done them all up for 150 quid each. Really? Uh, only to find them on the internet for sale the very next week. Oh! More than twice that price. No! And so I thought, well, I'm keeping this one. And so uh, I kept it. And uh, I did intend to use it because I installed bars and pipes on it and I started using it for music. Mm. Uh, but very soon after that, I got a 4,000. Uh, and also, um, I had my 1,200 anyway from Signosis and I used to bring that. Uh, my 1,200. <laughs> I used to bring that. Nice, nice. So I always had that to do music on and I had all the work, music stuff installed on anyway. So the 3,000 just, just uh, got mm. left behind really. And so it went up in the loft, all wrapped in uh, cling film. And, uh, of course, we didn't know then the battery damage occurs over time. Yeah, yeah. I, d I didn't even realise the 3,000 of the battery and the same as the 500 plus. Um, but, yes, yeah, it's, it's lovely to see that you've got all the uh, computers still. I know a lot of the, um, well, the, a lot of the composers and that. I know Ben Daglish had one C64, but... He didn't have a lot of stuff, but yeah, I can see it all in the background, which is pretty cool. Few, <laughs> yeah, some uh, old Mega 500s and mm. uh, Mega 2000 keyboard. Yeah. Uh, this, this is fine. That's the 4000 keyboard. Mm. Got another one upstairs. Uh, and and, and I've got some pictures. Key. I know you sent me some pictures last night, so when I edit this, um, I'll put up some media. When you mention something, I'll stick the media up. Um, you can see that 1200 in the picture. Of my studio at Signosis, that's that's there just behind in the, in the middle of the desk because that's that's what I did all the music on. Mm -hmm. uh, and awesome. in the other one, awesome. the later one, with me at Atomicon, on the right hand side is my A four thousand T, which uh, I have got here. It's in the Atomicon office actually. So mm. Back. And nice. Going for sale soon as well. God, that's <laughs> going to be worth a fortune. They're going for silly money anyway. It's got Let a Cy Cyberstorm Power PC M six O in it as well. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus yeah. Christ Jesus there's a, there's a little story about that too that's that's going to be going for a lot of money so um, our, our Amigas the, the 12 ones we've got, we had um, uh, I forgot it over there the GVP board oh yeah is that for the 500 is it uh, no for the A1200 <laughs> oh okay yeah I can't remember what it was it, it's, it's 68030 I think with 8 mega RAM or something uh, so me and Tim Wright had, had those in our A1200s and I was I took mine out one day and I can't quite remember why. I think maybe I was sticking more RAM in, mm. but I don't know why I would have needed more RAM. But anyway, I took it out. And Tim came into the room and he said, What are you doing? And I said, I I've just taken my board out. And I, I, I held it like that. And he walked up to it and he just put his finger on the processor and a little tiny spark came out of his finger and there was a click. No. And we both looked at each other and went... Static. <laughs> ESD, yeah. And I said, what did you do that for? <laughs> and he said, oh, no. <laughs> oh, God. It, it was broke. That's it. He, he knackered it. He fried the process. Oh. However, at that point, I had the uh, 4000T at home. That was another one that was just sitting in the corridor at Cygnosis uh, a bit later that they were going to bin. So they were getting rid of all the Amigas because they'd moved on to... Well, Photoshop had come out by that point, so textures were getting done in Photoshop instead of Deluxe Paint. And also, nobody mm. really understood the concept of getting a graphics card for the Amiga. So all of them were there, all these big box Amigas, and they were all just being used in 640 by 512 and 
using deluxe paint that way. So they were getting thrown out. So I took one of those. I had the 4000T by that point. So mm. I went upstairs and I said, my accelerator's broke my Amiga. I need a new one. Now, I had another Amiga at home that had a lesser accelerator in it. So they said, okay, well, well what do you need? And so I said, I need this one, which was the Cybersong Power PC <laughs> 060. Wow. 936 pounds, I think it was. Wow. Jesus Christ. Well, they're, they're that now. It's crazy. They yeah. like, they just hold their values. So Nuts. I brought in, brought in my accelerator from the other Amiga I had at home to use in my 1200 for Cygnosis and took the Cyberstorm one home, put it in the 4000. Nice. That's going to go for a lot of money. I mean, it's funny because they go for a lot of money now anyway because of rarity, but then you've got, which is why your A3000 is special. It's got the original software that was used to create, you know, what came out and the history behind it. So, yeah, that, I'm going to be watching that. I won't be buying it, <laughs> but I'll be watching it. <laughs> it's, got, um, it's got a Sunrise sound card. It's got the Buddha IDE controller thing. Okay. It's yeah. got a GG2 Plus board that lets you use ISA cards from the PC, which I used to use with a PC network card, so we can have it on the internet. Wow. Um, it's got a couple of other boards. and Oh, it's got the one-stop music shop. Uh, it gives you an extra MIDI output, and it's got onboard uh, Proteus sounds. Yeah. Um, and it's got... Um, and it's got one of these on as well, which is the. Uh, so, oh yeah, yeah. Okay, that's cool. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah, that's brilliant. Do not remove. Um, yeah. yeah. No, so, I don't think anyone will now. <laughs> hard drive, though. The reason I stopped using it because I used it for music until about 2010, and the only reason I stopped was because uh, the hard drive just packed up. Oh, so it's a I've shame, got. Isn't it? I, I had all of the contents of it, so I've mm. got a, an image of what the hard drive was, but there's no drive in it. So are you keeping any? Are you What's keeping that? any Amigas? Are they all going? Uh, I, I, I'm probably not going to keep any, to be honest. Um, mm. The reason is because, uh, yeah. So why why sell the uh, yeah why sell them anyway? Yeah, my, mine were all. I mean, I was a massive Amiga diehard, basically, mm. and. I've I've had that day, and I use them a lot more intensely than most people. And also, I've I've been through most of them. I've been surrounded by all of the Amigas for certainly all of my early career. So it's not like I'm a, I'm in this position like, oh my god, I've got a four thousand. I finally got one after all these years. Right. It's, okay. I, I, I've I've had them all. I've, I've, yeah. I've used them to a very intense degree doing everything with them. Mm. And I'm not going to use them again. I'm not going to use them productively because. Uh, I have. I've used one UAE. I've used an emulator for bars and pipes just because I wanted to have a go using bars and pipes again. And it works perfectly well. I don't yeah. really need to go through the hassle of, of the hardware again. Because mm. when people say there's nothing like having the, the real thing, well, for the purposes that I'd be using it, there's yeah. literally no difference. Yeah. As long as the timing is accurate when mm. I'm doing music uh, sequencing on it, then it, it's perfectly fine to me. Mm. If I was going to get another Amiga, to be honest, it would be one of the Eon ones. The X one thousand or X1. yeah, yeah, true, true. Because, because again, I can program, so I'd probably be programming little bits and pieces on it. There's a version of bars and pipes that works on it, and that's all I'd want it for. Mm. Uh, apart from doing stuff on it, not writing little programs and stuff, but because it'd be fun to do. Mm. So yeah, I'd probably get one of those rather than go back to using uh, old games. Because uh, yeah, I mean, in the real world sense. You're a composer, and that's what the Amiga was for originally. It's a tool, yeah. and technology moves forwards. You want the newest sound. You want, I mean, yeah. We was talking about native instruments last night, and um, just the processing power you need to do a certain synth. Yeah, I mean, you, you just can't use the Amiga anymore. It's a shame, but well, again, it would, only, it would only be for sequencing. I wouldn't do anything else with it. Mm -hmm. In which case, I would then have to have an Amiga that's connected with MIDI and I'd probably have the audio routed through my mixer as well. But mm -hmm. then that would have to sync with a door on the PC anyway. So I'm not getting any advantages. Mm. I might as well just emulate it if I want to do that. Yeah, true, true. Mm. Um, do you, while we're talking about that, do you, I know I've got a bunch of questions. I don't need to be in a certain order, but we was talking about your Insidious plugin last night. Yes. I yes. know it's one of your newest projects. So if you want to plug away, I'm sure to everyone would be interested. 
You say new, but I've been working on it for three years. <laughs> oh, really? Okay, I've definitely heard of it. That might be what it is. Um, I know it's, it is fairly recent, though. Someone's talked about it. Well, I just can't remember who it is. Because it's, it's been around, and every time I, I release a new version, uh, it, it goes back up to the top of the list on the, the, the download. Ah, and right. It becomes more visible. Again. So anyway, it's a Commodore 64 sound chip emulation, specifically the 6581 version. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah, it's taken me quite a long time. The reason that I made it was because I've got a hard SID Quattro in my PC, which has got four SID chips in it, and the driver for it only works on Windows XP. Oh, damn. Now, I stuck with XP as long as I could, but one of my updates to uh, Reactor, which is the software you need to use Insidious, funnily enough, um, Native Instruments... Didn't change the software. The software still runs fine on XP, but they changed the installer, so you couldn't install anything anymore. Because they'd come uh, up and say, oh, you require Windows 7 to install. And at that point, I had no choice. I had to upgrade. So then I went, moved on to Windows 8 and then onto Windows 10. And I've still got a partition mm. with XP on it, so I can go back to the hard set if I need to do testing and stuff with it, which is one yeah. of the insidious. So I've done weeks and weeks of oscilloscope testing and checking waveform outputs for all different... Um, scenarios with each of the four SID chips I've got and comparing that with the emulation. And uh, spent, yeah, nearly three years. Obviously, there was a big dropout, probably a year and a half, when I, when I went to a major new upgrade version. And then recently, I've rewritten all the os oscillators to the new custom versions. So it's gotten more and more close to the real thing, and now it's really, really accurate. Uh, and the filter is the key thing. The filter has taken me months and months to, to get right, because on, mm. on the 6581, it's got a really specific sound it's got some hardware bugs in it which make it distort and it's uh, it's really not like anything else but uh yeah that's, no, that's right. insidious 6581 if you have reactor to do your music then you can go and download it for free from the user library can you actually use it as a standalone mic well it, not outside of reactor right so you need reactor okay you do because any of the three ensembles require the um, the the full version of Reactor. There is a Reactor player, but that only works with the licensed versions. What I might do, I've, I've, I've signed an NDA with Native Instruments, so for a new version, I might actually do a, a separate standalone commercial version. So we'll see. Yeah. Okay, brilliant. Um, so, again, we'll just go back a bit. Yep. The reason why this 3000 is so special... Is because it's got a lot of the original Signosis stuff on it. Oh, um, it's got some. Um, okay. The, for example, it, it doesn't have the Lemmings files on it. It doesn't have. Um, it's got a few a few of Jeff's stuff which are in an old folder. Because what used to happen was because machines would transfer from one person to an X, things yeah. would be picked up, and I guess some of the photos he sent were some of the dev disks that I rescued. And if you look in the boxes, you will see a big stack of blue disks with a line across it and a marker. And that's, that's a complete hard drive backup. Oh, okay. That's like cool. Like 70 floppies or something like that. So some of those will be Jim Bauer's backups. There'll, there'll be some of Jeff's stuff in those as well. Now, a lot of those disks have already been imaged. So there is data that, that's come from those. So what would happen was the, the, the whole hard drive would be backed up into this massive bank of floppy disks. Luckily, uh, drives weren't that big because the one in, in the A3000 is only 100 meg. Mm. Nevertheless, that's still quite mm. the discs. Uh, yeah. Using Superback. And uh, then that would be wiped, given to the next artist. The next artist would, would go to town on it, basically. So the, the, the files which are on it are the stuff when it was taken away from Jeff, and then we had it over in Century Buildings, and it was used to do some of the Mega CD games. It was, well, Theatre of Death was done then. Oh, uh, nice. Air Patrol. Um, there's a lot of... Uh, weird stuff on it because artists can be weird sometimes there is uh, <laughs> yeah. of animations from an, uh, a beat-em-up that never got released I'm not sure what it was we, we were doing a, a game called Phoenix Rising which never got released but I remember that that was robots it was like a double dragon type thing mm -hmm. um, and this isn't that so I'm not actually sure what game it is but there's loads of characters that, that Darren Doug listed with all, all the fighting animations and stuff it's, it's, very, it's very good yeah Darren's, Darren's work's amazing and you, you sent a design last night. I'll put this up as I'm talking about it now. But um, there was a funny, like you say, because of their designers' creativity, 
Yeah. And I think you mentioned um, there's a picture of I'll show it now, but a picture of Richard O'Brien. Right. And you said that he actually made it into a character. He did, yeah. Th- that uh, I was talking to Darren about them when I uh, when I, when I got the, the A3000 switched on and had a look through all the files. And I took the photos of some of the stuff because I couldn't get the files off because of the issue with the floppy drive and the fact that it's scuzzy. So I just took some photos and I sent them over to Darren, which which he was quite shocked to see those. That's days. cool. That's yeah, cool. For 20 years. Um, yeah, that Richard O'Brien. He said that was the very, very first thing he drew on a computer. Wow, really? Yeah, that's awesome. It is. And so th- there was some other things he did. There's this ridiculous, it's funny Ace Ventura animation because he was quite the fan. And there's all sorts of other little test stuff, <laughs> some impressive <laughs> animation work that, that that he's done on there. And so later he took that and he said he made that into one of the Wipeout characters. So that, that's, that's, the, brilliant. that's brilliant. That's brilliant. I, mm. I might have to look for that and put that up now as we we speaking as well. So, <clears throat> just to run down a little bit, some of my favourites uh, Mike's done. So again, Mike done the music and sound effects. Bill's Tomato Game Amiga, yeah. Lemmings Two, but it was you say uh, you corrected me last night. It was a SNES version. That's right. Still using Brian- Amiga for it though. It was all done in Pro Shark, yeah. I, uh, I had uh, David Whittaker's sound routine for the SNES. And so it's all, okay. it's all just hex data. So it's just a okay. bunch of source code, basically, and you, you stick in your numbers. It's it's hard going. Yeah. So uh, it's so like it's, programming, programming again. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, and it's just a big bunch of numbers at the end, and it's so easy to get it wrong and miss a rest character and stuff. It's all good. But nevertheless, because that was so difficult to do, I used to write it all in ProTracker first. Because then I've got a, a nice uh, contiguous list of what the commands will be with, with the notes, and then I'd copy that into the hex data for, for the SNES. So that was four levels wow. for the SNES. Uh, wow. Mega Apocalypse 2 as well on the SNES. And uh, I was doing a SNES Bills Tomato game, but that got canned. Oh, really? Mm hmm. Wow. Yeah. Bloody, I didn't know that. There was something else I was making, I can't remember what it was now. Something else I was going to do on the SNES. No, I don't. Oh, I did uh, music for Super Drop Zone as well. Uh, yeah. That was like a version of the Mars Planet Suite. Uh, but I had to do. Anyway, sorry, yeah, you can carry on. No, no, it's fine. It's fine. That's what it's all about. Um, Brian the Lion, Microcosm. Oh, sound effects for Brian the Lion. Using my own sound effects player. The original, <laughs> was, it, was it Brian the Lion or did that one? Oh, no, it was Wiz and Liz. When, when Wiz and Liz. That's another one, yep. Yeah, when when was Liz was getting done, Ricky Ede was doing that, uh, and he he did a good job on the music, but thought the sound effects left a bit to be desired because all he'd done is, is sampled the sound effects off the mega the, the Mega Drive version. Right, and they were pretty big. It was about 120k for the for the sample, so I thought that's that's too much. Mm. So I've got a bit of time, so I wrote a, a sound effects player, which is like a little pro track and you, you can synthesize the sound effects. With. So I did that. It's quite neat. And I got it down to, I think it was 960 bytes, I think, for the, for the sound effects, including the player as well. Jesus Christ. <laughs> that's awesome. So that got used in Brian the Lion as well. But that's the thing. I, I know with uh, architecture years ago, I know now they just chuck memory and RAM and all sorts of, uh, sorry, memory and processor time and just to get it to go. But back then, it was one thing. Mm-hmm. And you had to work to it, which again, like limitation, it makes you more creative and trying to get that to fit in that architecture. And it was so clever. Well, it's the thing about the Wizard of Liz is because it sampled the Mega Drive sounds, they were all synthy sounds anyway. So it was quite easy to get it down because I was only using little tiny 20 byte looping samples. So they're just single cycle tones. And I was just doing trills and pitch changes and stuff with them to. Make them into what the actual sounds are. Right. Yeah, get them right down. That's neat. That's neat. So, actually, we'll talk about the FM Towns. Um, so, you've done Microcosm on the Amiga and FM Towns. Not well. Strictly speaking, I had a look at the what I did originally on, on Microcosm. That was that was the first game that I did where I was actually full time sound person with Signosis. When I started, okay, I was a game evaluator wasn't actually an audio person. I'd already done Bills to Master Game. I did that freelance before I got a job. But when I joined, there wasn't any audio people. 
and there seemed to be no course for it. But as Microsoft was getting done, it was clear that it needed to get done. So I got shoveled off to uh, the building down the road to work on that. So I worked on sound effects and FMV stuff and that. So that, that was the Towns version. Oh, right. So what um, is the Towns then? I've never heard of What is it? Is it? Fujitsu FM Towns. It was, oh, okay. You could think of it as basically being a PC that had uh, accelerated hardware graphics. It had a, oh, uh, right. an almost, they had a, a version of DOS and it was very, very PC-like. And it would run various PC programs, but nevertheless it had this hardware graphics mm. chip so it did my like, smooth scrolling and it, it was... It was good for the time. It really was here. Mm, I'm going to have to look that up. It, it was one of the first things that had a CD drive in it. So that's why we had micro, Microcosm on it. So uh, somehow we got paid by Fujitsu to do some games for it. Wow. And the, the CD drive is only 150 gear a second, single speed. And Microcosm was, it was quite difficult to make. It was a long time to make it because there was nothing that existed at the time. So everything had to be created from scratch. So the programmers had to not just write a video player, they had to invent the video compression routines. Jesus. And the code as well. Now, because the, the data stream was so small, uh, only video could play, so there was no audio. And MP3 had been invented then. And anyway, the processor probably couldn't have decompressed it in real time. Mm. So all the, all the sound that I did over the cutscenes was, <laughs> it was very awkward. I, had to, I produced a bank of sound effects and then I'd step through the animation and, and say, right, frame 13, you have to trigger that one. We trigger this, oh, I'll get you, up. right, right. That, trigger that one, loop that until frame 21. And then I'd just give that list to a program. And That's you'd clever. You'd have it triggering over, over the, the video when it played. Now, when the Amiga one came out, uh, all of that was binned, probably because of that reason, because all the sound was so specifically programmed. So the, the Amiga cutscenes just have music played over the top. And uh, uh, right, I think the okay. only thing of mine still in the Amiga is the intro, so I did all the intro sound on, on that. So mm, yes, the town that's pretty cool. Good. Nice bit of inside info there again. So you've done some N64 stuff, Wipeout. When you say some, it was Wipeout. That was oh, it was just Wipeout, was it? <laughs> just that, yeah. Oh, was it? Because these are the only ones that I know about. Okay, right. So, let's just move on a bit. <clears throat> What's the music? most memorable... Sorry, what were you going to say, Mike? I was going to say, Wipeout, most of the music was done by PC Music, which is a, a freelance group of guys here in Liverpool. Uh, and I did uh, sound effects and all the mastering stuff using the N64 sound tools. Which, funnily enough, uh, at uh, Playbox and Atomicon, the company that I'd run with one of my mates, we hired one of the programmers who worked on the N64 sound tools because he used to be at Software Creations. Wow, nice. The industry nice. is quite small. <laughs> yeah, I can believe it, yeah. So what was your most memorable ga uh, memorable game you made mu the music for? Is there anything, uh, I suppose there's many, but is there anything that you, you're quite fond of? Quite fond of? Well, I like all of them, really. One of the things yeah. about doing music is that whatever music I create, I... I make the music that I want to hear. So there's nothing really that I've done that I don't that I don't like. Mm. There's stuff that I could look back on and think well, I could have could have mixed that a bit better. Or <laughs> <laughs> I know what that feels like. <laughs> Bits and pieces here and there. But nevertheless, no, I, things that haunt you for the rest of your life. <laughs> um, anything that was particularly good at the time. Um, obviously, Bill's to Martin game was a big deal. I was. Uh, I was still in college then and got to do that. So that was, it wasn't my first encounter with Psygnosis because uh, around that time I was actually doing external game testing for Psygnosis. So I would get given some games, I'd take them home and I'd play them um, and fill in the bug report, send that back. I actually opened my first bank account for that because they were, <laughs> I think it was something like 15, 15 quid for, for, for every 15 bugs, something like that. I can't even remember what it was that I found. So yeah, Built to Mars game was a big one because that was the first music I'd, I'd, I'd done for Psygnosis. I'd done Last Ninja 2 and stuff for another company before a few other bits and pieces. Uh, but that was that was a big deal. Um, any other any other stuff? Not sure really. Everything was so diverse. Everything was done in yeah, such yeah. circumstances, especially because around the time mm. of around '94 and after we got bored, the whole industry was in such a transition. 
Mm. Everything changed, and the hardware cycles are so short. You'd get this piece of hardware, right? We've got to have to try and do a game on that, and then six months later, that'd be dead. Move on to the next one. Mm. And the hardware was so bad <laughs> that nobody really wanted to work with it because, and especially the way the mindset was of Cygnosis. Cygnosis was always looking five years ahead. It was never looking to see what the next bit of hardware was. And that's, mm. that's the reason we got bought by Sony, is because we had a research and development group that was just doing stuff, impressive stuff, just to see how far we could go. And, yeah, because of that, we were always looking ahead, and then we'd get hardware, and we'd try and make a game for that, and then that'd be rubbish, but we always wanted to do better and better. And around that time, there were so many cycles, as I say, the, 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 the processes and the scenarios in which I did all these different bits of music was so different that it's, it's really hard to say. I, I really enjoyed doing that one because they were all, all over the place, really. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, tell one, I'll tell you one thing I didn't enjoy, which was Lemmings Paintball. <laughs> really? I'm sure I'm sure I'd see that on the PC. Yeah, it was, was on the PC. On the, it, uh, yeah, it was, yeah, yeah. Um, I remember that years ago. The PC one was alright. It was okay. You know, I reasonably enjoy, I didn't like doing general MIDI music. That was the worst thing in the world. But one of the problems with the PC one was a stupid creative AWE32 sound card. Oh, it was so annoying. Because... <laughs> the general MIDI implementation was not like any other implementation. It had the same sounds, but all the volume levels were just all over the place, which meant that I had to do a very specific AWE32 version of all of the music just for the PC. Now, that was okay, <laughs> but then for the PlayStation 1, somebody came in and said, we need the PlayStation doing by Friday, and it was Monday. Oh, my God. And well, I didn't you have anything. And the PlayStation was a, was a real pain to do some stuff now they didn't want to use the CD audio and I really don't know why so I had to do it all as real time playback stuff like tracker stuff but the PC, uh, the PlayStation tools are awful and it had a MIDI player and you made banks of instruments and then you played them over MIDI and to convert the, the, the sounds was really difficult because the PlayStation chip has hardware compression in it and the hardware compression dictates that if you want to loop any of the samples the loop points have to be on 28 sample boundaries. Oh, right. So you can't just loop it anywhere. You've got to mm. be very, very specific. God. So you'll get horrible clicky loops for the most part. Oh, okay. So I, I had to write a little program to, to recalculate sample rate conversions and stuff for that. So I'd make the sample, and the loop section might be, let's say, 10,300. And then my little program would say, well, that's going to be this many bytes out for the loop points to match up. So therefore, resample that up to whatever it was going to be, 22, 22, 300 kilohertz, and then the, the loop points will then fit in the correct size, and then you're going to have to pitch it down inside the PlayStation tools by 14 cents, and then it would all be correct. So that took me ages. Now, it, it took me, because it needed to be done by Friday as well, it meant that I was in the office. Four Sleeping. Days, four <laughs> days and three nights. Yeah, without wow. No wow. Whatsoever. I was just completely and utterly disappointed. Wow. A lot of the Commodore guys done that as well, didn't they? When they were designing and stuff. It's funny how it's all sort of relative. Well, we, we did that quite a number of times for different games, but that was mm. the worst one. Yeah, three nights and four days in our sleep. Just mm. horrendous. Horrendous. I mean, Tim, wow. Tim Wright had a few sleepless nights doing Wipeout because he only had two weeks to do all the music. Most people don't really Wow, Jesus it. Christ. Yeah. It's cool, though. Well, it's, it's not cool, but... Yeah. That's just cool thinking that you know that's all it took to. Well, it's, it's it's easy for me to say, but you know, it's it's amazing. It's amazing. The, the the whole game was meant to have licensed music, and that didn't happen. And nobody realised, or nobody uh, finally admitted that that wasn't going to happen until far too late. And so yeah, they came to us and says we need music now, and it was potluck really. It was either me or Tim that was going to do it. I, I was busy with something. I can't remember what it was. So, so <laughs> and yeah, ten, two weeks and ten tracks. <laughs> Brilliant. Nearly killed himself. So, who actually? Uh, one question I haven't got. I uh, was thinking about it last night. Who actually designed the um, Cygnosis Owl? Roger Dean. And the actual lettering. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. Right. That's a really nice logo. That. Yeah. Every time you see it, even now, it's so it's gorgeous, I've lovely. Read that he came up with the name Cygnosis as well, but I'm I'm not sure if it was him or Ian Heavenson. If I see Ian again, I'll I'll ask him. But uh, if it was considering he came up with the lettering, 
Mm. Sense that he would come up with the word as well because he would fit the word around the the design. Mm. Obviously, he's a very visual guy. Mm. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, amazing stuff that he did. Amazing. So, uh, what does Signotis actually mean, or is it just a play on words, or where did it come uh, from, or I don't, if you if you split it up, I, I can't remember. The, it's something like. Um, the gnosis bit is to do with knowledge, and the the psi bit is obviously to do with something hmm. mental, or whatever it's going to be. So okay, it's yeah, like yeah. Brain knowledge or something like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought it'd have to be something like that. It's it's a nice sounding word as well. I'll will just just uh, just to reiterate, I've said this on a few other interviews, but uh, Ian Hetherington always pronounced it psygnosis, not psygnosis. <laughs> I've heard people say psychosis, yeah. yeah. But it, it it's the, the form of hypnosis. Right. Psychosis. Nice, nice. No, it's got a Y in it. <laughs> so have you got, apart from the Amiga stuff, have you got any of the other old hardware, like the Towns or the PCs or nothing? It's just yeah, the Amiga so, stuff. Um, I remember that when the, when the Amigas were getting thrown out, and that's when I got the 4000T. There was, I've got a bunch of monitors as well. I've got an old monitor, an Amiga monitor that's one of the Cygnosis ones. Um, it's one of the Philips CM8833 mm. artist edition. Uh, wow. But when, when they're all getting thrown out, I, I saw them in the corridor. I thought, what? What's happening there? So <laughs> I went and got Tim. And I said, Tim, there's a load of stuff in the corridor. <laughs> <laughs> What's happening with it? I, I saw the security guard. He said it's getting thrown out. Oh. So we, we went and, and found um, one of the one of the admin uh, women, the Lynn, and yeah, she confirmed it was getting thrown out, and also confirmed that we can have it, and also that there's loads of stuff in the warehouse getting thrown out as well. <laughs> so wow, we drove down to the warehouse, um, and there was just so much stuff. Oh god, it was, it was just crazy. There was just mm. so many old PCs, P90s, I think they were at the time. Mm. Loads of loads of four eight sixes. They didn't want those. There was a, a Sharp X sixty eight thousand. Tim took that. Uh, there was loads of Mega CDs and Mega Drives and stuff like that. It was it was basically all the old stuff that, that we just didn't want anymore. It's all going to get bin. Uh, Tim went a bit insane. Uh, I mean, literally insane. I've got this image of him. <laughs> Because we hadn't got the screwdriver, and, and all, although the PCs were a load of rubbish, some of the components were, were potentially useful. And he went around all of them trying to get the hard drives out of them. <laughs> we didn't have the screwdriver, and I just remember him, this image of him standing on top of this shell of it, going, ah, ah, trying to wrench out this hard drive. <laughs> we ended up back. I had a Ford Mondeo at the time. I mean, we put the back seats down, and the entire thing was just completely filled with just stuff. Wow. We were so embarrassed about it when when um, when we got back. I had to go and find a blanket to go and hide it in the car. <laughs> <laughs> it looked so dodgy. Yeah. But we'd been given permission to take all this. That's so cool. That Tim got the X68000 done. I didn't really take anything else. Because, again, you have to understand, this was 1994. We might have been into 95. Um, mm. And the, they, they were completely and utterly worthless. Nobody wanted anything to back happen. then. Yeah, yeah. You think about stuff like the Mega CDs. They they were awful. Mm. Everybody hated them. They were horrible to work with. They they were rubbish. Mm. Okay, it is funny. Terrible. And so it's just thank God that they're getting put in the bin. <laughs> 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 that, they're worth a lot now. They're uh, they're going for about four or five hundred quid on yeah, eBay. It's yeah, crazy. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, but there's no no value attached to it, and it's the same mm. with the assets as well. This is why all the development discs were getting thrown out. It was just old stuff. Yeah, done mm. that, move on. There's better stuff on the horizon. We've got mm. new machines. We can do more impressive things, and that's what it was about. This mm. stuff is not impressive anymore. We don't want it. Let's just yeah. get rid of that and move on. And, of course, now it's uh, it's, it's valued. It really is. And a lot, a lot yeah. of game history has been lost that way. I know mm. that we weren't the only company yeah. to, to act that way. I know that we did have um, – a lot of the stuff went up in the loft with Cygnosis when we went to the new building and probably never, ever got touched again. All the old backup discs and drives and stuff like that. So, so that that literally went in the yeah, yeah, mm. Mm. by the next company or whoever. No, but yeah, again, it's, it's I, the same building. Then. 
Tony's done. Oh, really? Yeah. I mean, my my Amiga, I can't remember. I think I'm, my 500 plus must have uh, suffered battery leakage. That's the only one that I ever had. And I was a student at school when I got mine. And uh, I think I was in Gillingham at the time. And I literally just left that in the cellar because... You know, even later on, I, it was just not worth anything, and it was all PC, PC, PC. Yeah, exactly. And as you know, the trackers on like a forty-eight channel by then, your sixteen-bit sound and yeah. forty-four one hundred CD quality, yeah. and uh, yeah, again. But yeah, I felt guilty, and funnily enough, I've rebought everything now: CD thirty-two, twelve hundred, and. It's crazy, really, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's but, too, it's too right, too right. I've got a CD32 there, which I'm selling. <laughs> nice, nice. Voyage. Have you got any dev units or anything? Of, any other special stuff or? Uh, not really. There's only really my Amiga 1200 and my Amiga 4000. Mm. Um, somewhere in in my mum's loft, I think, is the PsyQ uh, SNES dev kit. But oh, I'm really? I've not, not heard of that. that. <laughs> uh, because I remember I kept it, and I, I was going through one time, it's got this weird yellow circuit board, and I've got this memory of, of this, and of forgetting what it was. I'm like, what the hell is that? Because there's no markings on it or anything. It didn't say PsyQ on it. And I, I might have just binned it, but it might still be there, so the PsyQ dev kit might, might be there somewhere. I'm not That's sure. got to be rare. I've not heard of one of them. Yeah, we, we, had, we had them for everything. We, we partnered with SN Systems. SN Systems used to do a little bit of dev stuff. Then they eventually got bought by, by Sony. And Cygnosis started doing PsyQ development kits. And it ended up that our, our PsyQ PlayStation dev kit was something like a tenth the price of the official Sony one. And Sony, I, I'm not sure how it worked, but we were, we were pretty independent, even though we were bought by Sony. And in the end, they, they just gave in and the PsyQ became the official PlayStation dev kit then. And then wow. SN Systems eventually got bought by Sony and do all... I think they've become independent again now, but they did all the PlayStation 3 compilers and, and um, Vita and PSP and stuff like that. So they're very good. But we had those nice. for pretty much every machine in the version. Hmm. So what do you use now then, Mike? I know, obviously, we've covered the retro stuff, so you're still doing stuff for yourself, freelance yeah. now. Yeah. What do you actually use now? PC. And what's is it software or a bit of hardware or I have no hardware anymore. It's all it's all software. Really? Everything. Well the only hardware I've got is a keyboard. Yeah. Uh, you have a look, hold on. Oh, that's what I use. Oh that's that's gorgeous that. Uh, is it is that Yamaha, is it or No no, this is just a, a it's an M audio. Oh, so it's a USB controller, basically. Oh, yes. Right, okay. Oh, nice. This is QAT. So it is actually nice. exactly the same as one of the M Audio ones. It's the same mm. as the with a different brand on it. So that, that's my setup. It's all all software. Uh, nice. I, I just can't deal with hardware anymore. Yeah, it, I mean, you just need a big box PC now and a couple of USB ports, didn't you? <laughs> I've dealt with hardware for 20 years. And it's the same thing as with the games. It's what you want is mm. more convenient you want a better way to do it you don't want to have to mess around and you're always looking for that and now we finally got it I can have one computer that's got everything and if I want to go back yeah. to the old track I don't have to plug everything back into the patch bays and try and remix all the levels and everything again you just go load and there it is all yeah there. bang yeah I've still got some hardware it's in the Atomicon office um, mm. but I haven't used it for years I've got Kurzweil K2000 uh, which is also in that photo of my studio at Cygnosis because I took that one I left. And uh, Yamaha FS1R, which is amazing. And I would like to use it again, but I'd like to have a software version if possible, but Yamaha's never going to do that. It does sound amazing, <laughs> though. Yeah, it's a marvellous cool thing. Uh, I've got Cold Trinity down under the chair there, but that hasn't been used for years. Uh, all software. It's just so much more convenient. Mm, mm. It's much better. It's That's better. cool. Yeah. And, uh, well... I wasn't going to ask you this. Well, I don't think I should really, but a lot of people, I was supposed to be interviewing a Team 17, oh. but uh, Graham that sits here, he knows on the Team 17 crew, which is now Rockstar, but uh, there's a lot of things. He's not even, in his contract, he's not even allowed to talk to 
oh. anyone about anything. Otherwise, he's not even allowed social media, Facebook oh. or anything. It's so quiet. Um, but is there anything you that you can talk about or anything that you're working on that... Or is it hush-hush? <laughs> no, nothing at the moment, to, to be perfectly honest. Um, the only thing I've been doing is doing a, a, a little game for the for the Nintendo Switch at the moment. So it, it, oh, really? Yeah, there's no, no big deal. It's just a conversion of uh, one of the games I did years ago to the mm. Switch. Uh, and that, that's been done in Unreal now, so it's much better yep. graphically. And that's it. No, there's, there's nothing nothing really secretive or massive that I'm working on behind the scenes. <laughs> Yeah, one of the reasons is because because of, of the business stuff I want to do. So I'm I'm doing a, um, I'm going to be starting a startup to do some online software that I've, that's might be revolutionary. We shall see. <laughs> okay, so right, okay, so you're you're changing sort of career path a little bit. Well, depends how you treat that, because no matter what I do, I'll always be a musician. Who happen right. to be able to do okay. other things rather than anything else? Fundamentally, yeah. I'm, I mean, even at the Tom Con Playbox, there, I, I was technical director for for ten years, but I always did the music and sound effects because that that's that's who I am. I, I have, mm. to, have to. I'll, I'll die. Mm. Mm. <laughs> that's the core. Yeah, that's the core of you. Yeah. Um, so, any other hobbies? I think you mentioned, ta- yeah, table tennis. Table tennis, yes. Yeah, I started, uh, what happened was at Atomicon, we had a, we moved into a new office and the, the people who were there previously, they had a table tennis table that they just left there. So we got in touch with them and said, can we buy it off you? So we bought their table tennis table. So we had a, <laughs> for, for, uh, two, two, three years, something like that. It's still there in the offices that they're in now. So we, we played most lunch times. So got into table tennis. And then last year I started going to, um, one of the local places. So just joined the league recently. So quite into that at the moment. It's very good. Highly awesome. recommended. It. It's very, very strenuous. It's yeah. Very yeah. Strenuous. God, it makes you sweat. <laughs> I used to play badminton. So yeah, it's, yeah, it's go, go, go. It's crazy. Yeah. Good, good fun though. Good fun. Very much so. Yes. So the only, the only the other thing that I want to say before I let you go is, um, when this sells, because it's over a thousand at the moment on eBay, was it a thousand thirty or something? They say three thousand. I think it was, yeah. Last time I looked, um, we're, we're all eagerly waiting to see what it goes for. <laughs> so am I. I, 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 I didn't expect that to be honest. No, I mean, no well, yeah. I, I wondered. I wondered when it hit seven hundred. I thought, is it just going to stay there now until the last couple of minutes? But, but yeah, I was just wondering if when it does go, what I'll do is I'll probably put the buyer on this if if the buyer wants to speak and that get added to this then brilliant but um if not then that's fine but i wondered if you could actually contact them to say oh yeah we've done this so see what he wants to do with it and i know a lot of the guys in the scene are actually um i posted last night saying what we're doing today um and someone said oh i think it's is it one or someone uh, said, oh, what he should do is dump all the stuff if he gets it running and preserve it. Mm-hmm. I said, but well, that's, I suppose Mike would like it, but that's down to the guy who buys it. Yeah. Uh, because again, like you said, it's a catch-22. It's a little bit faulty, so. Well, that's, yeah. that's one of the reasons why I haven't pursued any further, because if, mm. it's, if, if it's the drive that's on its way out, I don't want to keep going mm. through power cycles. When I know... Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you say I, I, I tried to get the files off. I try, I've got a, a, an old cat weasel board, so I tried mm. plugging that in and sticking a new floppy drive in, but that didn't work. I don't know if the cat weasel or the floppy drive really because they haven't been used for uh, 15 years or something. So mm. who knows what, what's happened with that? It um, might even be the battery on them tracks causing the issue. Yeah, that that would be the mm. fuzzy controller having having a problem and getting mm. it in there. So yeah, mm. I, I didn't want to mess with it anymore uh, I just wanted uh, the buyer because I mean the buyer doesn't have to do anything with it if they wanted to just stick it in a cupboard and, in a glass case and well that's fair enough uh, and they don't have to do anything with it then it's, if that's the way they want to preserve it then, then exactly. it's fine exactly. However, I know that I'm not in a good position to be able to, to resolve those problems <laughs> so hopefully whoever gets hold of it can, can sort that out yeah 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 fair play 
but yeah thanks Mike it's been brilliant and um, oh. I might bump into you in, uh, at any retro events if you go I mean I think I've seen a few interviews on YouTube uh, was it a Manchester Play Expo at one That's point right, yeah. yeah I did see that so, there yeah. We was in um, London at Play Expo this year mm -hmm. um, filming. We saw Jason Bradbury down there, but I gather you'll be there on a panel or something and uh, yeah, we'll might bump into you there. We'll <laughs> yeah, if anybody offers, then I'm generally up for those sorts of things. Mm, so. Yeah. Well, after this, I know um, I've seen the 3000 been on various sites now. Um it's probably going to expose you a little bit more as well. Yeah, You're like probably that. going to be arsed all over the place. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. We'll see how, how, how famous the machine is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> brilliant. Yeah. That's brilliant. Thanks a lot, mate. I appreciate that. Yeah, my pleasure. But yeah, it's uh, not just for me. It's for the community as well. Okay. Well, it's been great. Anybody has any other questions? Uh, I'm sure <laughs> yeah. I can be found around the internet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, if there's... Um, Mike used to work at Atomicom, but yeah, he works for himself at the moment. But yeah, if anyone wants to ask him any questions, are you on the any Amiga groups or anything? Uh, I'm on EAB from time to time. EAB. Uh, I'm on the Amiga groups on uh, on Facebook. Uh, yeah, that's about it, really. Yeah, I'm not going to say direct thing because it's it's not right. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. Thanks a lot, Mike. It's been brilliant. My pleasure. All right. It's been awesome. Thanks a lot. Have a good day. Thank you. I'll speak to you again. Merry Christmas. Yeah, and you. Yeah. <laughs> God, yeah. I was I was in a mind meld then. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Okay. See you later. See you later, matey. Right, right retro, retro gaming, gaming. Wednesdays, Wednesdays 9 GMT, GMT.